Back in 2015, I went to Cologne, Germany for a work trip. I put it in quotes because it was all on the company dime, but all it consisted of were a bunch of team building exercises involving several different offices from around Europe and the US. There'd be go-karting, paintballing, numerous lunch meets, and nights on the town. So although we were there in a professional capacity, it was basically a paid vacation. I was honestly super psyched to be there. It was my first time outside of the US, let alone Europe. So our first night there, I went out with a work buddy of mine, hitting up a few small bars after dinner to sample some German beers. And I do mean sample because, despite what everyone said afterwards, we knew darn well that we couldn't get sauced since we had our first team building activity the following morning. So we're drinking smaller glasses of all the different beers in one place than moving on to the other. These glasses couldn't have been any bigger than 8 ounces or so, and we weren't totally finishing everything. I know it sounds dumb, but even though we were drinking, the aim was to not get drunk. My point is, by the time we got to our third bar, we were basically sober and had told ourselves that that would be our last stop before returning to our hotel. We walked up to the bar, checked out the drinks menu, then ordered two small glasses of Fruli, which turned out to be a bright red strawberry beer. Then as we're talking about how awesome it was, some guy sidles up to us like, Americans? We get talking to him just about where we're from and stuff and it turned out he wasn't German, but had moved there from someplace else when he was a kid. I didn't want to press him on it, as the way he talked made it seem like kind of a touchy subject, so we just moved on to other stuff like why we were visiting Cologne. It's around then that he started asking if we wanted him to hook us up with any girls. I knew exactly what he meant by that, so I politely refused on mine and my buddy's behalf, laughing it off and assuring him I was married. He moved on to drugs, asking if we wanted hashish or cocaine or ecstasy. Again, I'm like, no thanks, remaining polite. But then the guy kind of pauses, looks us both over, and asked me something that shook me to my core. He leans in so the other drinkers wouldn't hear him and he says in a low voice, It's boys you want, yes? I can get you boys. Very young boys. My buddy was in a mid-sip as the guy said it, and he just about chokes on his fruly as I tell the guy to take a hike. I didn't think he was serious. I thought it was more supposed to come across as an insult or something, but afterwards, I'm not so sure. I think as horrifying as it may seem, he might have actually been able to follow through with that offer. Anyway, like I said, I just told the guy to go kick rocks since he was getting on my nerves. The guy kind of sneers at us, laughs the rebuke off, then walks away, taking a seat with a bunch of guys over in the corner of the bar. Me and my buddy work through our beers, siphon the pythons in the bar's bathroom, then head back towards our hotel room. On the way out, the guys in the corner of the bar are giving us major stink eye, but with me being semi-street smart, I just knew to stick to brightly lit places and try to shake their tail if they tried to follow us. We walk for a few minutes, no one follows us, so I think we're all good. But it's shortly after that that I realized I was actually really, really drunk. It made sense, I know, I'd been drinking, but I was too drunk. Like, way too drunk for the amount I'd actually consumed. Literally, the last thing I remember is saying, Bro, I feel gross. Then there's just nothing. I know we kept walking for a while, but I don't remember where and I don't remember passing out or seeing those shady guys from the bar again. But given that both me and Buddy woke up a few hours later, just as the sun was starting to rise, and he had been completely rinsed clean of all valuables, I'm willing to hazard a guess as to what happened. All the symptoms we felt the next day were completely consistent with being drugged with GHB or some other kind of sedative. When we reported it to the cops, they had us give urine samples and tested our urine, and lo and behold, they tested positive for some kind of knockout drug. It wasn't specifically GHB, but it was some other long three-word name, but it basically had the same effect, and we both felt absolutely terrible for the next whole day. Honestly, 
It's not the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Like, I know it could have been so much worse, especially if those dudes were as shady as I think they were. But that's just it. I think what they did was kind of a warning. Like a, this is what we're capable of kind of thing. How did they manage to slip something into our drinks? I have zero clue. It must have been when he cleaned it, but I didn't see a thing. It certainly makes for some impressive sleight of hand, and certainly makes it clear that whoever we're dealing with, they were pros. Heck, if they'd really wanted to, they probably could have made us completely disappear. We missed that first team building exercise in the morning of the second full day. Go-karting too, which really stunk knowing that we wouldn't be going again. But we had bigger fish to fry ultra-dangerous criminal fish, too. But no matter how detailed of a report we gave or how much we pointed the German cops in the right direction, they came back with nothing. I think the closest we got to a definitive answer was when one cop said that he strongly suspected it being the work of an Albanian group that were known to scam tourists. As soon as the guy said it, both me and my buddy were like, yeah, that sounds about right. The shady guy did say that he was from another country, and his unwillingness to talk about it could have been genuine. I know all the ex-Yugoslav countries went to some terrible times in the early 90s, which could well explain why the guy was in Cologne in the first place. Thankfully, we never ran into those guys again, and the rest of the trip was so much fun it pretty much made up for the initial drugging and robbery. But I always let it serve as a reminder that not everyone in a foreign place is some kindly stranger, and letting your guard down in a new and unfamiliar place can come with a heavy, heavy price. Shortly after I graduated college, I decided to do a little traveling around Southeast Asia. I'm not some trust fund baby, the only reason I had the money was because my dad had died in my senior year. It was a mammoth task just to ensure that the grief didn't affect my studies too much, so by the time I graduated, a long vacation was sorely needed. So a few days after I arrived in Bangkok, I was exploring the Khao San Road when I bumped into a bunch of other Americans. I know I was supposed to be soaking up in ancient eastern culture, but my god, if it wasn't good to hear some familiar accents that far away from home. But as much as it was nice to meet up with those guys, they were way too crazy for me to party with. All I wanted was a few beers and some Thai street food. But those crazy leathernecks were trying to take themselves out by vodka while chasing snake blood. And that wasn't code for anything either. They were literally looking for a place that would let them eat a snake's still beating heart before downing a shot of its blood. Like I said, way too crazy for me. So when we bumped into a Canadian dude who was working more at my pace, I said my goodbyes to the Leathernecks who were headed to some crazy strip club, while me and a Canadian guy moved on to somewhere much more chill. We found this little sports bar, got talking hockey, and ended up chatting with these two hot South African girls. I'm working on one, he's working on the other, and at one point, one of the girls invites me into the little smoking area for a cigarette. I don't smoke, but I sure followed to keep up the momentum, so we ended up chatting and flirting out front of this little sports bar, right up until we heard the scream. Obviously, our conversation ceases immediately, and we're both looking around to try and see where the scream came from, and it didn't take us long to find out, because just across the street, clear as day, is this Thai guy and he's punching some black girl in the face over and over again. And what's worse, no one was doing a thing about it. They're just walking past, pretending it isn't happening. Now I realize that not only should I do something, but I'm presented with a golden opportunity to impress this South African girl by being a genuine white knight. So, I give her my beer to hold, and I run over and try to break up what was a very one-sided fight. I'm all like, Hey, hey, what's going on, man? She's a girl. You can't hit a girl like that. He lets her go. She runs away. And now it's just me and this guy with almost everyone in the street staring at us waiting for me to do something. I lower my voice, adopt a slightly more respectful tone, and tell him, Look, man, 
You can't just hit girls like that. But the guy just steps to me, this grin on his face as I realize the bouncers from this nearby bar, as well as a handful of tuk-tuk drivers, are all walking over to encircle us. It's only then that I realize there was a good reason why no one had tried to stop this guy from hitting that girl. He was somebody. Somebody well known to locals and tourists alike. He was someone bad. You don't know who I am, do you? The guy said in alarmingly perfect English. Most Thai people know at least a little English, so they're able to corral tourists, but it's heavily accented. But this guy talked with what I can only describe as a British accent, like he was that well-spoken. I just told him no, not exactly the truth, but it was more like I just needed to see where the situation was headed. Then as I'm eyeing this guy's backup, which had just materialized out of nowhere, the man himself takes a step forward, put his hand around me so he's grabbing the back of my neck, then draws his fist back in preparation to punch me. Now I'm not exactly some MMA master, but I did attend some jiu-jitsu classes in high school, so I knew enough to be able to block the punch by dropping my head and raising both hands flat to my forehead. I follow up by shoving him away from me and then trying to back up to get out of there. But bang. Someone behind or to the side of me throws a sucker punch, and I just felt my knees buckle out from under me. Next thing I know, I'm being helped into some other bar by some guys who'd obviously seen me getting destroyed. They're trying to hold me up and they're trying to walk me behind a bar, probably to give me some first aid in a back office or something. I'm hazy, beyond belief, but I'm grateful enough to the guys helping me that I try to turn a little to thank them. And that's when I see it's the same guys who had just knocked me out in the first place. They weren't holding me tight to keep me up steady. They were holding me so I couldn't get away. They wanted to get me in the back of that bar all right, but I suddenly realized that it probably wasn't for anything good. So I start to buck and wriggle, trying to escape their grip. More punches come in. I start screaming for help and I turn to look at all the customers, trying to see if any of them will help me. But then again, it was just like when that girl was getting punched. All these faces, western and Thai alike, and they're either just silently staring or acting like nothing is happening at all. I've never been as scared as that in all my life, man. It's one thing having something scary happen to you, but it's another when all kinds of people can see it, but are either too scared or too apathetic to do anything about it. That's a special kind of terror right there. And it comes with this... this feeling of doom. I don't know how else to describe it. Like you're condemned. Like you're a dead man walking. Then right as they get behind the bar, right when they pry my grip off the bar hatch, I hear this oddly familiar voice shouting, Hey, hey, get your hands off that man. I look up, and it's the marines I'd been drinking with earlier. They must have been walking past the bar, still in the search for snake blood, and heard all the help screams I was bellowing out. Then, being the kind of people they were, they ran in the direction of the trouble, and found me. I know you all probably want to hear about some big bar fight that exploded into action with tables and chairs being thrown as the marines came to my rescue. But fortunately for me, there was no such destruction. Once the marines made it clear that I was with them, I figured the Thai gangster thugs must assume that I was a marine too and if they ended up beating up or killing a US serviceman, there might have been more trouble for them than what it's worth. So they just let me go with the gangster dude making out that there had been some kind of mistake. He even apologized to me as I limped out, telling me to come back soon with your friends, drinks are on me. But dear God, I'd never go back there. In fact, I tried to avoid the Khao San Road entirely after that. I know it's mostly just friendly business types, giving the younger tourists a fun experience abroad, but there are people down there who live and breathe violence and exploitation. And I think that's what I want to say to any prospective travelers. Don't treat foreign countries like places you can't be hurt, or where actions don't have consequences. Because as much as I think I did the right thing overall, I know it almost got the life beat out of me. And maybe, even worse.
Six years ago, I flew over the Atlantic to South Africa for my first ever safari. I've always had a fascination with Africa and the wildlife of the Serengeti, one that actually stems from being obsessed with the Lion King when I was a kid. I had that Elton John soundtrack on cassette tape too, and I used to annoy my mom by belting out Circle of Life every time we drove anywhere. But over time, that love for Simba and friends evolved and matured, and soon I was reading books on Maasai culture. It got to the point where I was fixated on the idea of traveling to Africa, and while my sorority sisters talked about visiting the beaches of Bali or the Bahamas after they graduated, my heart was set on the Serengeti. It took me years to be able to afford the flights, accommodation, and in-country transportation, but eventually, I had a good enough job and a padded enough bank account to be able to afford my dream trip to South Africa, and it was every bit as amazing as I imagined. I spent a whole week on various jeep safaris, hanging out of a 4x4 with a pair of binoculars, and let me tell you, even at a distance, just knowing you're looking at an actual lion is a serious adrenaline rush. On one of the safaris, a nice Canadian guy mentioned how incredible an experience it was, but lamented that he couldn't just get a little closer to some of the wildlife. Our guide reminded us that even at 200 meters away, some of the wildlife we were admiring could close the distance in just a matter of seconds. It was every bit as humbling as I expected, like I've never felt quite so vulnerable in all my life, even in the relatively safe confines of the various jeeps I traveled in. But that feeling was nothing compared to what I felt when I decided to take a very different kind of safari. I first started properly considering an air safari after I landed in Johannesburg and began to see various commercials for them. I'd never really been interested until I spoke to someone on one of my jeep safaris that talked about air tours like they were God's gift to naturalists. According to her, air safaris were by far the best way to see the wildlife, and she'd go on an air safari every time if she could only afford it. Apparently, the animals don't react in quite the same way to the buzzing of an overhead aircraft as they do to a loud, clearly visible jeep and she mentioned that the best way to get unfettered views of the animals acting completely naturally, it was with an air safari. That settled it for me. It didn't matter if it had take a chunk out of my budget, I needed to get on that air safari to experience the same rush that she had. I ended up exchanging emails with a representative from one particular air safari company who promised me an extensive tour at a very reasonable price. A few thousand dollars later, I was meeting up with a bush pilot on this little airstrip in the middle of nowhere and staring at the single engine propeller plane that we'd be flying around the Serengeti. The battered old thing looked like it'd be like 20 or 30 years old, but the pilot assured me that she was the most reliable aircraft in their inventory and that she'd never failed him yet. I was a little apprehensive, but since he seemed so confident in the plane's abilities, I saw no reason to disbelieve him. If he didn't think it was safe, Surely he'd be the first person to refuse to fly it, right? So with that in mind, I climbed into the passenger side of the prop plane and off we went into the skies above the Serengeti. At first, it was everything I'd hoped for and more. The plane flew low and slow enough for us to get some frankly incredible views of the animals, and I was amazed that they didn't react more than they did to some big metal bird in the sky buzzing over their heads. Only the younger animals in each herd seemed to pay any attention to us, all the while moms continued to graze like, chill, we see these things all the time. Sometimes we'd fly up just a little higher than lean into a gentle turn that allowed us to circle any herd that I took an interest in, giving me a full-on bird's eye view. I'll admit it was a little less personal than the jeep safaris, we didn't quite get the same adrenaline hit, but little did I know, I was about to get a lifetime's worth of adrenaline in just a few short minutes. About 20 minutes into the flight, we were circling over this herd of elephants, with the steady droning of the plane's engine buzzing in our ears. Then suddenly, the buzzing stopped. It didn't just stop dead either. There was a stuttering, start-stop rattling sound as the engine tried to keep itself going, but then it just gave out altogether. I looked at the pilot, completely baffled, but he waved away my concerns while thumbing the plane's ignition, making out like it happened all the time and nothing was to worry about. I've stalled my car in traffic before, 
Slightly embarrassing, but nothing to worry about. So I figured what we were going through was the aviation equivalent of just that. Irritating at best, scary at worst, but still nothing to actually worry about. Yet as I'm waiting for the engine to whir back into life from the pilot's repeated attempt to restart it, it dawns on me that this isn't some run-of-the-mill mechanical problem. The engine had died, and it wasn't coming back to life. And that horrifying fact became obvious once the pilot stopped trying to restart the engine. How I managed to avoid a complete mental breakdown, I don't know. But as the pilot turned to me and said, We're going to have to land, I just heard, We're going to crash. I remember wanting to ask him if we were going to die, but the words just wouldn't come out. I just stayed quiet as the pilot talked me through what we were about to do. We're not going to crash, don't worry, but this is going to be a bumpy landing, okay? Again, I couldn't say it, but at the time, I was convinced it was the end. And when I realized that, this weird feeling of calm came over me. This bizarre acceptance, and all of a sudden, I found I was completely calm. It was like there was no point worrying about something that I was doomed to face. We were going down and there was absolutely nothing I could do about it and other than brace for impact. The only thought I had left by the time we began to drop altitude was hoping that it would be quick, that we wouldn't burn to death before the vultures devoured whatever charred mess was left. At 200 feet I was concentrating on my breathing trying to keep calm as the trees and foliage below got bigger and bigger. At a hundred feet, I began shaking unlike anything I've ever experienced before. I mean, think less nervous shaking and more terrified vibration. I turned to ask the pilot something and I remember him barking back, shut up and let me think, woman. It was the kind of comment that would have me clapping back in any normal situation. But in a dead engine prop plane over the African bush, I decided to just take it on the chin. At 50 feet, the pilot suddenly shouted, Hold on! Then our nose tilted down slightly and he began to bring us in for the emergency landing. I remember just gripping onto this little handle in the cockpit. But I couldn't watch, so I decided to just shut my eyes and hope for the best. Then wham. We hit the dirt hard. But instead of rolling over or crashing, I could feel the landing gear of the plane rumbling against the earth. The plane was shaking like a leaf, and I was convinced it was about to just fall apart at any moment, but somehow it didn't. I heard the pilot shouting, Come on, girl, come on, you can do it. As he talked to the plane, then out of nowhere he just started whooping and hollering in celebration. It didn't feel like we were safe but the pilot evidently knew that the worst was over and that we weren't going to just explode in a ball of flame. When we finally came to a complete stop, the pilot started laughing maniacally, kissing the dash of the plane and telling me, I told you she hadn't let me down yet. I was in just complete, total shock, thinking, oh my Jesus Christ, I just survived a plane crash. I literally just survived a freaking plane crash. And that's when the euphoria hit. I'm still shaking, but I'm turning to the pilot, high-fiving him, telling him he's the man. It was the most intense feeling of my entire life, and one I'll never, ever forget. We were pretty banged up, but we were otherwise okay. It was nothing short of a miracle. But we weren't quite out of trouble yet. Once the euphoria died down, we realized we were stranded in the middle of the Serengeti, and our crash had attracted an awful lot of attention. Now, most animals would have literally run a mile to get away from the big metal bird that came crashing down to Earth. But not all of them. Some were attracted to the chaos and the destruction, and it led to my closest encounter with any animal in all of Africa. We were quite easily able to relay our rough coordinates to the rescue team and the pilot had a few flares that he could light and throw out on the ground if it got dark, so it's not like we were going to be stuck there for a frighteningly long length of time. But even the 90 minutes or so that we had to wait seemed like an eternity, because we totally were exposed to all of the wildlife the Serengeti had to throw at us. We got kinda lucky in the end, I think, but 
we still had a rather close encounter that frankly scared the life out of me. When you think of the scariest animals in Africa, you tend to think lions, maybe hippos, definitely snakes and spiders. I doubt many people's first answer would be hyenas, but you can bet your butt that that's my answer after a pack of them wandered within just 50 feet to get a look at us. People say they laugh, right? How the hyuk hyuk sound that they make is kind of like a person laughing. Let me tell you, once you hear that sound with your own ears, it sounds nothing like laughter. It's terrifying. I remember jumping back in the cockpit of the crash plane like, there's hyenas over there. The pilot was taking a freaking nap but woke up to show me the pistol he kept in the same place as the flares. Let me know if they get close and I'll give them a fright, okay? Now try and relax. Try and relax, he tells me. Try to relax with a gang of baying hyenas just a few feet away. If ever there was a clear sign that that bush pilot was completely insane, it was that. But I still owed him my life, so you can bet I didn't say squat to him. Not long after, I heard the distinct sound of an engine in the distance and the plane's radio buzzed into life. It was the rescue team, having driven as fast as they could for almost a hundred miles to reach us, and I'd never been so happy to see another human being in my whole life. They drove us back to civilization, and I ate the single best meal of my life with a pilot at this little roadside diner. He asked for two orders of bunny chow, which turned out to be an entire loaf of bread stuffed with curry, and as it turned out, a bunny chow and several beers are exactly what a person needs after surviving a small-scale plane crash in the middle of Africa. Back in 2004, me and the wife decided we couldn't face freezing our bits off for yet another British winter and started looking for a much more tropical location to spend the festive period. We were working on a bit of a budget and couldn't quite afford the Thai or Vietnamese beaches we'd had our hearts set on, but after a little bit of searching, we came across this lovely little beachside bed and breakfast in a little town called Gaul on the southwestern coast of Sri Lanka. It was definitely priced as a budget hotel, but the photos the owners had taken showed it to be a quaint, clean, and beautiful little place. And once my wife was taken with it, I had very little choice in the matter, so I made us a booking. The food was amazing, the people were welcoming, and the beaches were everything we could have hoped for. Come Christmas Day, we had the most unusual Christmas dinner of our lives, sharing a veritable banquet of different dolls and curries at a local restaurant and it was so good that neither of us missed pigs and blankets that year. And I'm sure most of you will agree, that's really saying something. We finished off with a few drinks on the beach, stopping every so often to giggle at how surreal it all was that we were sunbathing on Christmas Day. Then, once we were drowsy enough, we headed off to bed for an early night. The next morning was even better. No hangovers, no dodgy leftovers to work through, no going down the local park in the freezing cold to pretend that a brisk boxing day walk is anything but an absolute ball ache. Just sun, sea, and sandy beaches for five more days. Me and the wife replaced the horrid boxing day park walk with drinks and nibbles in this beachside cafe, nibbling on dips and papa doms, wondering how we were going to readjust to life back in the UK again. I mean, it had been literally paradise for almost a full fortnight, we could have never have possibly guessed in that moment that our festive little Asian trip would turn out to be the biggest mistakes of our lives. But we soon learned that a dream day can turn into a living nightmare in just a matter of minutes. So we're just sitting there in the open air restaurant, holding hands, both enjoying that lovely rhythmic sound of the waves gently breaking against the beach, when suddenly it stops. We heard that big rush as the water was pulled back away from the shore, but no crash followed, and me and my wife watched as the water crept further and further back away from the shore. And I don't mean by like a few feet or anything, it just kept going and going, until you could barely see the edge anymore, and there was only wet sand as far as the eye could see. I distinctly remember the moment I saw these tiny specks on the wet sand in the distance, and how it 
almost looked like they were jumping up and down. Only that's exactly what they were doing. They were fish that had been swimming in the shallows when the water had just disappeared. Now they were flapping around in the sand, gasping for breath. I turned to see the young waitress standing behind us, and I'm about to ask her what was happening, but her face told me all I needed to know. She was gawping even harder than we were, and had obviously never seen anything like it in her life. The next thing I know, there are people running out onto the wet sand with plastic bags, scooping up the fish into them before moving on to the next poor flounder. It was actually quite amusing for a moment, thinking it must have been the easiest morning's fishing that any of them had ever experienced. But the next moment, I hear this absolute roar of a shout coming from down the beach. An older man was bellowing something out to the lad scooping up fish, then he turns and starts shouting with his hands cupped around his mouth, like he's trying to announce something to everyone. I turn around to the Sri Lankan waitress to ask her what's being said, but by that time, her dad showed up, the cafe's owner, I later found out, and he has this horrified look on his face. I could tell he was looking out to sea, so I turned to see what he's looking at, and that's when I saw that the water was starting to come back in, only it wasn't returning as gently as it had rescinded. It was getting faster and faster, and the wave was getting bigger and bigger. Sir and madam, please, come upstairs. I remember the owner saying suddenly, There's a big wave coming, a very big wave. We must all go upstairs now, very fast, please. The cafe was basically a big hollowed-out concrete block, so I was confident that we would indeed be safe if we went upstairs, where there was another open-air dining area. The only trouble was getting everyone up there, as the owner's elderly mother was confined to a wheelchair. I didn't actually see her at first. She was in another room when we all started to move, so I was halfway up the stairs by the time I saw the owner wheeling her to the bottom. It was honestly one of the most horrifying moments of my life. This horrendous, oh no, moment. Because the guy was trying to pull her up the stairs backwards in the wheelchair, but he clearly didn't have the strength to do it on his own. I basically pushed my wife up the stairs, then forced my way back down them towards where the owner was struggling with his mom. I grabbed one handle, he grabbed the other, but that wasn't working, so we tried actually carrying the whole thing by grabbing the wheel spokes, but again, that wasn't working. The whole time I can hear the wave getting closer and closer, my poor wife from the top floor saying, oh my god, oh my god, as it's getting near to breaking. Then it struck. We didn't have the owner's mom up as high as we needed, and all this water and debris came crashing over us. It was pure chaos for a second. I was grabbing onto the banister and to someone's arm or leg. I couldn't tell whose, just holding on for dear life. All of a sudden, the water level drops a bit, but it's still rushing past us. This lets me see that I've got hold of the owner's arm while he has hold of his mom's hands. The wheelchair was nowhere to be seen like it was there one moment, gone the next, just dragged away by what turned out to be a 15-foot high tsunami. I'm sorry if my writing starts to take a turn at this point. Remembering all of this is really, really painful, and I'm sure you'll understand why in just a moment. So I'm pulling with all my might, trying to keep the owner and, by proxy, his mum from being washed away. They're just too heavy for me to drag out of the water, and I'm actually struggling to hold onto myself, so... I'm absolutely terrified that I'm going to lose grip, which will mean not only do I die, but they die too. I can't even express how ashamed I am to say this, but there was a moment where I thought about just letting go. I know that sounds absolutely soulless, but the kind of terror I felt in that moment, I'd never experienced anything like it in my life. It was like something else just took over for a moment, a screw everyone but me kind of attitude that placed my life above all else. But even in the moment, I knew I wouldn't be able to live with myself. It just seemed out of the question. If I lose grip on them, if they get ripped away from me, that's different. But for me to just let go seemed a bit too much, like murder for me to go through with it. Next thing, I'm snapped out of that horrible moment by screaming from the owner and his mum. They're saying things to each other in their language, so I don't have a clue what they're saying. 
I thought I could pretty much guess that they'd be saying, don't let go, I don't want to die, I won't let you go, mom, stuff like that. But then, and I'm choking up as I write this, the owner suddenly let go of his mom's hand. I thought she might have slipped or something, but the way he turned so purposefully and ran back up the stairs, I knew that he'd just let her go. I was stunned, absolutely stunned, but as I said, I'm just in survival mode, so I followed him up the stairs to the safety of the top floor. I feel my wife bear hug me, this full body impact before she burst into tears. It hadn't occurred to me, but because she hadn't been able to see what I was doing, she thought I'd been washed away. She's crying and screaming at me, where did you go? And I swear I wanted to tell her, but I just couldn't. Instead, I looked over the edge of the open top dining area and I just gasped at the utter destruction below us. The entire landscape had been completely transformed. It was almost unrecognizable, and the water just kept going and going inland, never slowing down, never stopping. I remember the moment I realized it could have been happening to the entire island, just miles and miles of coastline completely and utterly destroyed in just a few minutes. Yet although it was bad enough when the water was coming in, it was even worse as the tide dragged it back out again, because all that death and destruction that was caused bulldozing its way inland, it was pulled back past us as the wave returned to the ocean. There were so many bodies I lost count. Every other second you'd see a patch of pink or brown flesh floating on the surface, maybe a streak of color from someone's clothing. There were so many dead, so many who just didn't see it coming. But the hardest part for me to bear was yet to come. When the majority of the danger had passed and there was just stagnant water on the floor below us, the owner and one of his sons ventured downstairs to bring up what little food and water they could salvage from the flooded kitchen. We knew rescue wouldn't be quick, and people were already working their way through the mess outside, pulling out dead bodies and survivors alike. Me and my wife pitched in as best we could, but the fact remained that there just wasn't much we could do at that stage, other than try to comfort the handful of people with us, Sri Lankans included. That night, none of us could sleep. Even with the free beer that the owner had given us, so... When I saw him smoking a cigarette in the darkness on his own, I thought I might give him a bit of company. I hadn't smoked since I first tried in sixth form college, but that night, I asked him for a smoke, and we shared a beer and a cig in silence. Then out of nowhere, he says, I didn't want to let her go. I didn't even really know what to say to that. I knew he was referring to his mom, but I didn't know if he was just trying to rationalize it or what. So I just nodded. I told him, I know. I know, mate. But he shook his head. He goes on to tell me that his mom had told him to let her go. She knew I couldn't pull them both in, and she also knew that it wouldn't be long before we'd all be dragged off. So she sacrificed herself for us. The owner told me what their little exchange had been, and I swear to God it almost broke me. He said it went something like this. Let me go, son. Let me go. No, mom, you'll drown. If you don't let me go, we'll all drown. Just hold on. Son, I've had a long life and I've had a good life. You've been a good son and you made me very proud, but your family you need to take care of. Do as I tell you. I love you, mom. I love you too. Goodbye. He said he couldn't bring himself to say goodbye, so he just let her go, turned, then went to look after his family just like his mom had told him to. This all happened nearly 16 years ago, and I still can't talk or think about it without tearing up. I can't even imagine being in that position and just knowing it happened was completely traumatizing, so God only knows how he actually dealt with it himself. I think that's why this has been so helpful to type up. I can't really talk to anyone about what happened that day, people beside the wife anyway. I either get frustrated that they don't understand, or if they ask too many questions or worst case scenario, I start thinking about the owner's mum, I choke up, and then there's no more talking at all. 
So rather than suffer the embarrassment of being a grown man in tears, I just shut my mouth and tried to deal with it. But I don't really think there is anything to deal with. I think to an extent that trauma just becomes a part of you. It doesn't hurt anyone. It's not debilitating. But it's always there. Like the scar left behind after a deep wound. You just learn to live with it. If I said to you Medellin, Colombia, what do you think of? Pre-2015, only a handful of people would have given the answer that is commonplace today. But since that narco show was on TV, almost everyone knows what Medellin is famous for. And that's for being the home of the Medellin cartel, headed up by the one and only Pablo Escobar. These days, the Medellin cartel are confined to the history books, but the legacy of violence lives on in the city and the problems didn't exactly die along with Escobar when the law caught up with him in 93. But it's there, in the city of Medellin, that I met a girl named Stephanie while I was traveling around South America. Steph was from Canada, on a similar sort of rolling vacation as I was, and there was this almost instant chemistry between us that ended with me asking her out. We drank cheap, Colombian beers, compared traveling tattoos. She definitely won with her traditional tippy-tap Filipino tribal piece, and generally just had ourselves a great time. But when it came to the end of the night, we were put in a rather precarious position. You see, that old legacy of violence and suspicion means that in a city like Medellin, you can't get anywhere without the right credentials. And as a result, Neither of us were allowed any guests in our respective hostels. So we thought on our feet and decided the night was warm enough for us to spend it in one of Medellin's public parks. So we spot what seemed like a nice enough place to lay down. Only as we're walking over, we see these four Colombian guys hanging out on a bench. No reason to be suspicious, right? I mean, it was a nice enough night and the South America idea of a late night is totally different to ours, so not everyone hanging out past midnight is some kind of reprobate. I suppose that goes for the states too, but I digress. So me and Steph are sitting there for a few minutes when one of the guys from the bench comes over to talk to us. My Spanish is still embarrassingly dire at that time, but I knew enough to know that he was asking for a cigarette. I told him I didn't smoke. No fumo, lo siento but he carried on asking for stuff like money than other things with words I didn't understand. I kept saying, Lo siento, lo siento. Tengo nada, tengo nada. But he just won't give it up. He keeps talking to us, then spits out something mean sounding in Steph's direction. So at that point, I really take issue, and I have enough Dutch courage to tell him to get effed before I lead Steph off to another spot further away from them. I'll spare you the finer details of what followed, but needless to say, Steph and I ended up having a little cuddle, shall we say, until we heard and saw something that almost scared us half to death. A police siren, and flashing lights, and it was just a few feet away near the boundary of the parkland. Steph quickly pulled her dress back on, and we attempted to make ourselves as presentable as possible as the cop car screeches to a stop. Two guys jump out and they come jogging over to us. How they knew we were there, I don't know, but I figured the guy asking for smokes had called them and has a kind of screw you for not being generous to us. I'm on the verge of a full-on freakout as all I can think is, I'm going to end up in a Colombian jail, and that's going to be the end of it for me. Colombia has some of the worst prisons in all of South America, and to no offense to our Latin cousins, but that's really saying something. What's worse... I didn't have the money to pay a fine or a bribe, so there was absolutely zero chance of me talking my way out of it. But still, I didn't really have a choice. The best I could hope for was to pull off a speech skill 100, so I got down to it. As this little Colombian cop, I don't even say that to be mean, the guy was literally no smaller than 5'4", is shining his flashlight in my face. I'm just pouring this stream of bilingual, apologetic consciousness that probably sounded something like, 
Dude, lo siento. Seriously, uh, no borrachos. Uh, I'm cansado. Just, I'm just tired. I'm sorry. I swear to God. But all the cop does is scold us in Spanish, talking so fast that I can barely understand a word. Steph is like welling up with tears at this point, as she too obviously thinks she's about to be arrested. All I could do was shut up and let the cop burn off whatever angry energy he had, and just pray he didn't drag us both off to jail there and then. I just hit him with a, lo siendo, uh, no entiendo, until he finally kind of calms down and pulls a smartphone out of this police vest thing. When I see he's pulling up Google Translate, I know something isn't quite right. If he really was just going to throw the cuffs on us, he'd have done it already, right? So what are we about to type out? I'll never forget what came next and how I foolishly tried to anticipate his words without stopping to consider the context. First thing he typed was translated, These men and pointed over to where the cigarette guy and his friends had been. I look over, expecting to see them looking all smug, but there's no one there, and it dawns on me that they'd beat feet as soon as they'd seen the cops arrive. I go to say something like, Yeah, I know, they called you, I'm sorry. But the cop cuts me off with a little sock puppet hand gesture, clamping the thing's mouth shut as if to say be quiet. So I do as I'm told and carry on watching him type. These men, he continued, are very dangerous. You must leave now, or they will come back and... The cop stopped for a second, like he was trying to find the right word, then wrote, They will come back and violate the girl. Understand? My chin is dusting the floor at this point, like I had no idea we were in that much danger, and right before I can say anything, the guy types, They are known to us. They have done things before will do things again. Again, we just nod, too stunned by how dumb we'd been to really be relieved that we weren't in any trouble. The cop then types out, don't come back here during the night again, shows us the message, then escorts us to the well-lit street nearby. As you can imagine, that whole thing really killed the mood. And even though I walked Steph back to her hostel, there was never any talk of me getting inside to continue where we left off. I saw her a few more times before she moved on to Argentina and yes, we did conclude some unfinished business, even kept in touch for a while after I returned to the US. But you can bet your bottom dollar I didn't go anywhere near any poorly lit places in Medellin, not for the remainder of my stay. I'd learned my lesson, and I learned it good. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.